Hello everyone, my name is Paweł Szygulski. I'm a journalist from uh, WNP.pl web uh, portal. We are talking today about Industry 4.0 and my guest is uh, Mr. Joachim Hensch, uh, an expert in Industry uh, 4.0 and the man who who was um, who was uh, starting as a tailor and uh, now he's an expert of industry 4.0 uh, hello uh, joachim good morning good morning everyone yes um, tell us uh, how, how how did it happen that you are here an expert but you were starting as a tailor what is your story so tell <laughs> us in in a few words <laughs> it's not it's not the um the the clear and fast track <laughs> to to start in in um in um sewing suits by hand and then ending up um being an expert um in in industry 4.0 and and to be an expert also to be clear is something that is only temporary because i mean there's always a layer on top of on top um so it's it's just um something for for like now so how do i how did i start i started um i wanted to um to study art actually i wanted to be a, a, a painter you know an artist and um and then but then my uncle said listen um if you want to make a living then probably you do something else because uh, just mm -hmm. painting is maybe not um, not enough he was an artist actually and so i thought okay how can i be creative and um and also have a living so i I thought then then I go into the fashion business, you know. There at that time there were lots of German um, uh, designers like Karl Lagerfeld, Jill Sander, and others. So I went into this business, and I I always I was always intrigued with understanding how things work, you know. Like I I I um, I got a lot of gifts at my birthdays, was never never survived because I would always dissemble them and try to understand a watch, a clock, whatever. I would always uh, try to 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 look behind the curtain. So I started as a tailor, really to understand tailoring and not just designing something. And I fell in love with this uh, for a couple of years. And after um, after being in this bespoke to couture tailoring story, which was interesting because it was a one-on-one -on -one connection. You would you have one customer and one suit that you produce for. So this is really like odd and many people talk about order size one when you go when you are in tailoring that's actually order size one you have one one customer and one suit so i did this for a couple of years then i went into the industry to learn a little bit more about efficiency and be more productive and i fell in love with this idea of having one idea and deploying it to many you know so so i stayed mm -hmm. there, um and i gave up with my idea of a tailor shop and I stayed there in the industry and then I went, um, I started to work for Hugo Boss in, two, in 1995, which I never, I never wanted to go into a big organization, uh, which is strange because uh, in the last five years, I was then managing director for more than 4,000 people. So it's kind of, you know, life is full of um, um, surprises. And, um, and then I moved into the, um, the, the, the management, um, became head of, um, of the product development. And technology was always something fascinating me as an enabler. And, um, and I remember very well when um, in, in 2000, in the year 2000, when we had our first PC, which is strange to think about today, but we had our first PC in the, in the department with like 20 people. And we had all of a sudden, we had access to Word and Excel and, start, and, and PowerPoint and making descriptions for our models. Um, um, uh, much, much easier, so much faster. So technology as an enabler to be faster and smarter in the way you do other things was something that fascinates me always. And so I, I, I really um, went and um, uh, started to dive more into this digitalization, digitization of processes and, and, and things. And later on in 2014, I attended um, a workshop, uh, um, a masterclass about Industry 4.0, and then I learned something about the digital twin story. And uh, and at that time, that was really the moment when I understood what I was working on for like 10 years, more than 10 years. This digital twin story, understanding Industry 4.0 as an enabler to do something physical in a better way. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so this was the combination of of doing these things and then in 
2015, I went to Turkey and I had the chance to, to really build a smart factory from the ground up, from an operational excellence factory very well to, to become a smart factory. So a lot of surprises that have um, effects yes. on, on a career, on a life. Yes, yes. And finally, in Izmir, you, you, you introduced, uh, you transformed factory to, to a smart factory, to, to the factory that, uh, that uses uh, means of uh, industry 4.0. Uh, and uh, my first question um, is, uh, is how, how, how can we prepare a framework for this, for transition to industry 4.0. We are starting and uh, what should we do at the beginning? Uh, how can we do this framework? Uh, what is the best way in your opinion? Yeah. So I'm, you know, I left, I left Hugo Boss last year and I'm, I'm working now as a consultant for this industry 4.0 transformation journey. And what I always tell people, the first is that they should build a framework around this, this digital twin story, about this concept of, of Industry 4.0. Because what I always hear is that people have, um, people typically solve problems, you know, they, they have a quality problem, so they introduce a quality management system. Uh, software, typically. They, they want to have more information on the shop floor. They um, they look for IT companies providing um, uh, MES systems for the shop floor or ERP systems for something or maintenance software for something. And what is the missing part, and that is why it is so important to, to first start with, in my opinion, first start with this overall frame is that you should first understand what industry is, industry 4.0 is about. And just to give you an example from our, from our private life, um, I don't know if you if you like to do jigsaw puzzle, but um, many people when you do jigsaw puzzle, many people um, I mean people do this differently, you know, and um, and there are some who always start with the outer frame, you know, they look for the pieces who have one side flat. They always try to find this frame, and they first build the whole frame before they even think about the inside of this mm -hmm. jigsaw. Then they start sorting to colors. And then they start assembling pieces, bits and pieces, and putting them into this into this puzzle. And then ultimately the puzzle um, gets finished. And interestingly, is we don't touch, uh, we don't tackle Industry 4.0 in the same way. We think predominantly about the technology that solves a single problem, and you end up having a bunch of solutions which have no connection because there is no connection. So it it's like you would puzzle five different puzzles and, and you have no clue that this should ever become one picture. So what I would mm -hmm. always start with would be the idea of what is my industry 4.0 approach because you don't want to, I mean, you don't have to copy another company because you are your own company, your own organization, your own industry and you have your own metrics and your means. So, for example, in the apparel industry, uh, the apparel industry is, is, is people heavy. So you have to care very much about data and people. Mm -hmm. While you're probably in the fast moving consumer goods or production of um, pharmacy or something is very technology driven and not so much people on the shop floor. So you have another frame that you have to think about when thinking about industry 4.0. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have to establish your own way for, for the transformation, not, uh, not only follow uh, others. No, there is no copycat story. That is really mm -hmm. what I learned. Um, uh, it is, uh, I, I was in 2014, I was at, um, at the Siemens factory in Hamburg um, and, and they do um, uh, main boards and sockets and uh, semiconductors. So they do a lot of electronics manufacturing. And uh, I was there because I wanted to learn something about Industry 4.0. And what I what I was fascinated by was was this digital twin story. And they were, I mean, they we we were brought to a to a room which was full of monitors, and they could see and sense everything. They could see everything that happens on the shop floor. 
uh, and, and on the shop floor, there were not many people and the people were just feeding robots, you know, they were just feeding systems with transistors and whatsoever and, and monitoring um, the machines that would assemble um, the products. So it was highly automized working, I guess they were working in three shifts, highly automized, but what, what was interesting is that I saw, I really sensed and I could feel this digital twin concept. And that is what I took later then to Izmir and, and, and I talked to these people and, say, and, and thought about, okay, what does it actually mean for my industry? If this is the, the, the basic principle, then how can I build my story of industry 4.0, uh, which, which I think is, um, is what, what many people don't do. They see something fancy on, a, on YouTube and then they think, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Let's copy this. Ah, okay, the software were from XYZ. Okay, let's get in touch with these software guys. And then um, <laughs> sometimes I get emails like, uh, I saw your video. Um, let's introduce Industry 4.0. And then I say, okay, hmm. yeah, it's Industry 4.0. I mean, who are you? What is your business? How is your structure? How are you working? What kind of information do you need digital? And I mean, you don't have to do a copycat. You have to build your story. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. So, how can we find the the most important things for us? The points that are crucial for the transition for for transformation. Uh, how to prior uh, prioritize uh, this? Uh, what is the most important in in a such case? In in our case, in the case of of factory. So. Um... So the thing is that if you if you think about um, if you think about the the last decades of improvement on industry in the industrial sector, then every everything was mainly driven by copying Toyota. Mm -hmm. Everyone to you know I mean they were everyone was fascinated by these Japanese guys um, uh, going into the U.S. market wiping away market share, taking market share in the automotive industry and having a higher margin per car than anybody else. So, so people were very much thinking about how can I copy this kind of idea of improving the current? I have this production, like I'm producing ice cream or I'm producing tires. And so how can I learn from Toyota how to improve what I do? And that turned into this, uh, I mean, people talk very much, but everyone talks now about Kaizen, everyone talks about Lean, some know more about it, some know less about it. But basically what everyone understands from Lean and Kaizen is that it is always to find the most optimal way with regard to your resources. And that is a quest, you know, that, that's something that's a journey. That's not something you don't hire a lean expert and, um, and have him uh, work for three days with your management team and then you change and your productivity rise 10% and off you go. That's not how it works. It's a, it's a lifelong improvement strategy. Kaizen is a mentality. It's, it's, it's a mindset that you introduce your, into your company and, um, and it takes years to build this culture. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about Industry 4.0, this is basically the same because sensors, if you think about the third industrial revolution, which was in the 70s, last century, um, with the introduction of the PLCs and the PCs and the computers entering the industry, a lot of people understood that uh, we get smarter machines. You know, I mean, you, you could immediately send, I mean, especially in, in the car, in the automotive industry, people could understand the robots better, could make better programming and such. And, um, and that turned into a culture, into a culture of understanding that I have machines and they have PLCs and I can make a program and something. So it, no one would dare to program a machine by hand anymore. Everything turned into this PC story. Now, with this Industry 4.0 approach, is very, this is something quite interesting from my perspective because um, over three industrial revolutions, we have uh, built human robots. We have improved the organization more and more 
and it was and and the execution or let's say the concentration was always on the machines making the machines smarter 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 and now with this fourth industrial revolution um we have the chance to to get closer to the people again because we built these copies of of um execution systems and digital twins and it's a little bit like our personal life we have we have real friends and real neighbors mm -hmm. and at the same time we have social media channels and we have thousands of linkedin connections and facebook connections which probably 80 percent of them we have never met <laughs> like us we meet the first time here mm -hmm. and, about this. and um and the same is with this industry 4.0 approach i mean you all of a sudden you build an ecosystem which which has not been there, you know. And the thing is that you have to make this a philosophy. You have to make this um, a principle of your management style or of your way of how you see your factory. And that's why I compare this with this Kaizen momentum and this lean momentum, because that also was not done in a day. And it was, and it Kaizen really flies and lean really flies when everyone in the organization has understood this and appreciates this and says okay that's great to improve to get ever better and i guess the same is with with regards to industry 4.0 this is not something that you can yes you start in top management but it's not, nothing that you can leave in the offices is something that everyone has to somehow feel sense embrace like okay and now on Facebook, I can meet many people. And my daughter right now, she is writing a master thesis in Fuerteventura. And I can talk to her every day and, and, and write with her every day. So I have no difference in my feelings. I have no difference between seeing her physically or having a FaceTime with her. And although these are different things, and of course, they are, but the emotions are basically very comparable. And the same is with thinking about industry 4.0 as a principle. You don't think differently about your physical factory comparing to your digital factory. That's why I'm always emphasizing on this um, philosophical approach of a technical execution. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is too vague, but I mean, this is something that I, um, that I embrace very much. I see. So, so we should see that uh, that the g digital uh, digital factory is is the same as physical factory, and we should uh, treat it as as one thing. I see. But um, you know, you you had in Izmir in factory in Izmir four thousand people, four thousand employees, and yes. uh, uh, th there is a lot of people and. Uh, what was the challenge to to introduce all of them to this to to thinking uh, about digital factory to digital thinking uh, was it a huge challenge uh, what can you what can you say about it yeah yeah first thing yes it was a huge challenge <laughs> it's 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 not an easy thing um, but I guess this, that's with every change, you know, if you, if you change dramatically something that is already, and that's the thing in Izmir, if you change something that is already quite well, you know, doing quite well, and then talking about a new strategy is quite hard. If people are desperate, that's easy. If you have a problem and you, and you are desperate and you say, okay, I can, I can change that, uh, then people will follow you easily. In Izmir, it was, it was very different because Izmir was, um, was a fantastic factory for 15 years, um, implemented everything like Kaizen, like Lean, Zig Sigma. They had, um, they had a, a very well um, operating systematic. From my point of view, it was over-engineered in terms of, um, of flexibility though. Mm -hmm. And that was my main concern when I came there. My biggest concern was that with the upcoming complexity of markets and uncertainties of markets, well-established operational excellence line have the lack of flexibility. They do the same things extremely well. 
But when it comes to thinking differently and then saying, okay, mm, we cannot do this anymore. Now we have to do that. Then, oh, wait a minute. Oh, we have to, then we have to change the, the layout. We have to change the people, the skills, the management principles. Oh my gosh, you know, that makes people shake typically. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all felt when this pandemic came, you know, all of a sudden we were, we were in the situation of finding copies, digital copies of our physical behavior, like no more business travels, no more business meetings, no more meetings in the offices, all of a sudden home office, how can we handle that? Um, it, no one is prepared, no one was prepared for this. And that is something that some people made this quite easy and some people really struggled. And the same appeared in uh, in Izmir when I came there, and um, and and I saw this. I, I knew these colleagues for the for from the beginning, so I knew what they do well. Um, but when I came there, I said, "Okay, listen, guys. When what you do is, I, I will not bring any content, any additional content as a as a managing director to what you do well already. But what I can tell you right now is." that if you continue to do so, then probably in five years time, you will have really serious problems because there's always a cheaper place for commodities. There's always a cheaper way to do something. And if you don't change yourself to a more adaptive and more flexible organization, then you will run into serious issues. Of course, people thought I'm crazy, <laughs> you know, because if you have someone who, d who does things well, and then telling him this, what you do is not enough in, for the next years. That's kind of an extreme statement, you know? So I had a couple of conversations about this saying, okay, um, maybe you should first understand what we do well here before you start making this statement. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's true. I should better understand what, what you do well, but um, I will not, um, but I have a feeling also, and I have my insights and I have a, um, some other industry insights and market insights and that and what you do is not going to be enough in the future. So I can either wait here and manage with you the current situation until you run into serious problems with profitability or flexibility, lead times whatsoever, skills, or we start changing now. And that was my approach, saying, okay, listen, guys, thank you very much for what you did, and now we move on to something new. And it will be a crazy thing because... Um, because it is not defined for our industry. Industry 4.0 in apparel is not defined. There's nothing, you, there's no media market where you can buy a PC and just make the installation. It's not going to fly this, this way. We will have to build our strategy. We will have to build our devices. We will have to build our ecosystems and we will have to build our skills that we need. So it was quite a huge bet. The, the thing with, with me maybe personally was that, um, I thought, you know, I was 51 and I thought, okay, what can happen? The worst thing that happens is you fail and they will fire you. I mean, the people will not burn me. They will not shoot me or kill me. People will maybe fire me because they will th think I'm crazy. So I'm going to find a new job, um, which means like um, I was 2000 kilometers away from the headquarter. Um, Izmir was huge. The organization was actually quite well. Uh, there was an IT department, HR department, um, organizational development. There, there were lots and lots of bits and pieces that you need for a transformation that were all in one location. So that was a big advantage, I must say, from now, for, for looking back. And then what I did was that for like the next year, I would a thousand times repeat the same story. We will become a smart factory. And I would not go left and right with that statement. Whenever I was talking to the top management, whenever I was talking to the shop floor, when I was talking to these operators, when I was making town hall meetings with all 4,000 people, I would always and always and always tell the same story, which for me is something that I always say is you have to create your North Star. You have to create your, um, Simon Sinek that says, start with why. If there's, mm -hmm. there's no appealing story behind the transformation, then you will too early dive into problem solving. And, and that's, that's coming later. 
So you have to first build a story for, for your organization, no matter if you have four people or 4,000 or 400, you have to create a story that people can commit to, that people can follow to, that they can see that there is an advantage in that. And in, um, in the Izmir case, it was um, uh, saying, okay, we will become a smart factory. And the reason for becoming a smart factory is because the market is changing, not because I like computers so much. The reason is the market is changing, the market conditions are changing, we have to flexibilize our um, OPEX structure. OPEX is not enough for what's coming. And the way to handle this is not doing the same things just faster and making people more nervous, but the, the way we do things is making things smarter. And that's why um, I was always saying, we will build a smart factory. And, um, and I really did this everywhere. Like if I was talking to the cleaning personnel or I was talking to the top management, always, if you would ask people in Izmir about my first year, people would always say, okay, he was always talking about smart factory. And, um, and then, we started, um, I started in July 2015 and then we had our budget meeting in September. So we had an offsite meeting in July with the top management where um, my idea at that time was that it, to do something so differently, you have to, to do it top down. There's no way that you can do this bottom up. You have to do this top down. So you cannot start with the problems. You have to start with the strategy. So, um, mm -hmm. so I started with the top management at that time um, and started to create this journey uh, with these 15 fantastic colleagues. And, um, and we built this journey around Smart Factory for the next years to come. So we started with defining the long-term strategy. And that is what I always tell my clients as well, starting with the long-term journey and, uh, and not with the problem solving and then diving into the, the journey and saying, okay, what is, what is it that I have to do now in order to reach this target in three years or five years time? And that is something that later on, it, 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 you know, it trickles down. And then when you build this frame, like this puzzle piece frame, then no matter whom you talk to in your organization, if you talk to your plant manager or you talk to an operator on the shop floor, there's always something that, that connects to this overall story and you can find an immediate um, flight height, let's say, of the topic that you talk about. If you talk about an operator, then you talk about devices that make his life easier. If you talk about a manager, you talk about systems that make his management easier to manage or his team easier to manage. If you talk about the CFO or you talk about the vice president finance, you talk about this, a system which improves your profitability. But no matter whom you talk about, it is all in one frame. It is all in one story. And that is why ultimately it is not so, um, it sounds strange to actually execute a strategy with 4,000 people, but it, if, you have a, if you have a picture which everyone can commit to, then you always find an answer to the different levels of people you talk to. But um, how long uh, was it till you till you saw that uh, this commitment of people of employees is really really working? That they are they are became becoming to. Uh, mm, they are becoming co committed to to this to this project. Yes, <laughs> that is that is not an easy thing, and uh, and and that starts with it, it. It's actually very personal. So if I'm a so as a manager, I was always super impatient for results. You know, if it is a project that should be executed, or it was the the, the performance of the factory, the financials. I was always impatient because that's my job as a manager, managing director, to be impatient and to be um, uh, to be keen on results. That's what what this ha how this happens. Um, 
if you're an operator, you want to have a better life and you want to have a better earning. You want to have a better salary. So, and, and, and that's basically the same, you know, it's not, it's not so different. What you have to think about is when you think about industry 4.0 as a tool, you have to think about each and every position in your organization and what is the gain for these people when you implement this strategy. So I give you one example of, um, of a regular employee. Oh my gosh, there are lots of questions coming. <laughs> okay, anyway, mm -hmm. I give you, I give, you um, I give you an example of an employee. Um, for example, in this in this factory, there was a there is a bonus system which is um, which has of course fixed comp com um, components and it has um, 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 result oriented components like quality, performance, and others. And when I came there, there was a manual system of, of collecting all this information and there was a data collection system, of course, but it was actually, for an operator, it was not so easy to determine what is my current wage, what will be the salary by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And so people would go into the HR department and say, listen, I just got this, this slip here, pay slip, and I have no idea why, I, why can you explain me, please, what are my my um, uh, my metric? What is the metrics here behind this salary? So they would go there and and ask for this. And then we said, okay. So the first thing that we need to do, if we want to make people understand what the digital twin is about, what digitalization is about, then we have to think about topics that they have as a problem, issues. And so we we knew that hundreds of people every month, every beginning of the month, they go into the HR department and ask for explanation of their salaries. And so we built eight terminals, huge touch screens, which at that time were quite expensive. Um, I think it was like 8,000 euros per touch screen or something like that. We built eight terminals where the people could go with their personal ID card and look into their salaries and get and get a get a better get a better understanding and get an explanation about their salaries from the last month now you can argue okay what does this have to do with result improvement or efficiency improvement and i tell nothing but it has to do with i mean first of of course there was less traffic to the hr department but what happened here was that people started to understand what this digital twin actually is. Mm -hmm. so they would not go to the HR department anymore and ask about this information, but they would just go to this terminal, pick their card, put it in front of the reader, and then saying, okay, what's my salary? And then understanding everything by magic. You know, all of a sudden you see and you understand things that you didn't do before. And you needed a personal conversation for some. All of a sudden, you just need this touch screen, and you touch three buttons, and you get the information you want. So, people, regular operators, started to understand what digitalization actually means. That it is not something fancy, and it is not something for the top levels, for the upper levels to understand, but it's something for them as well. And when later, we started to install Andon boards, digital Andon boards, digital tablets. They, they had already embraced this idea, oh, there's a new device coming, which will probably make my life better, easier, more transparent. I can understand better what I earn and something. We had, um, we had um, a professor from, uh, a couple of professors making an analysis about the impact of digitalization to their stress factor. They made a, they made a, a research. In, uh, and they had like hundreds of people were interviewed. And they said, but does it, and, and these professors said, okay, but is, isn't it so that this, this transparency puts pressure on you? And they said, no, not at all. Because I'm, with this technology, I became my own manager. I know what my performance is. I know what my quality level is. I know what my skill performance is. I know I can determine my own surrounding with this device or with this technology. So they were not stressed at all with this, but they were seeing this as a benefit. And I guess that's something that I really learned that a lot of people underestimate, that they, they think from the solution, they start saying, okay, we need industry 4.0, so let's put this to the IT department. They should care about finding the right software. Then we talk to the engineers, finding the right implementation. 
but you don't think that WhatsApp and Facebook was, um, was invented by asking the engineers and the IT experts first. It was solving a personal, a really personal, deep personal issue and then thinking backwards about how the software should be programmed to solve this issue. And, that, and that's what I always tell uh, um, uh, clients that they, they should think super basic when they think about the benefits um, of, of Industry 4.0. I see, but you know, you you said that uh, the um, factory in the in Izmir was well organized, well well doing. Uh, and what what if uh, if the organization is not so well organized? So what if there is uh, some mess and this organization uh, uh, wants wants to um, wants to go to the industry 4.0? What should uh, the manager, the director, do in in this uh, situation? Yeah, I mean, one thing is for sure. If you and that is also um, um, that is one part of the introduction story is cleaning the mess. I mean, what you if you have an analog mess, you, if you have an analog situation which is messy, and then you put a digital copy of this on top of your analog situation, then you have two messy systems. So you don't think that, and people should not think that digitizing something that is not prepared for this will make their life better. It will make their life worse. That is super important. So if you, if you have not um, understood your processes properly, if you have not optimized your flow properly, and then you put like, okay, let's put some sensors and some digital devices here on the shop floor and then everything will run smoothly. That will not fly, I'm absolutely sure. Because what you cannot understand physically, you cannot, neither you can understand digitally. Which means like if you're a company that um, has, I don't know, 25% downtimes or um, um, issues with quality or issues with skills of operators, um, not um, uh, has a spaghetti diagram of flow in the production, which is a disaster. That That's probably, I would not tell them, okay, listen, um, take the next half a million budget and put it into software and sensors. I would first start to say, okay, let's let's dive into this analog mess and try to find first to optimize this and understand what you do, and then determine what of this can be replaced by digital, and what of this can then um, can be put into this industry 4.0 approach. But that's super important. I mean, you cannot um, you cannot digitize messy stuff. And, and if you talk to uh, big data analysts, uh, and I, I know this by experience, what I'm saying right now, because, um, because we, we had also a strategy of, um, of, of collecting lots of data, making, creating, we knew that we can, only we can only work with data if we have data. So first you want to connect a lot of devices, people and everything, and then you can collect this data, and then you have big data analysts who start making machine learning and putting all this stuff on top. So we were installing lots of sensors, we were doing lots of, we were collecting lots of information and then we started hiring the first big data analysts. And I was super, um, I, was, uh, I was super happy with that because I thought, okay, now we move. Now we have the data and we have the big data analysts and it will be fantastic what will be the outcome. And they just said, you know what? This is just noise. This is just digital noise. We can do nothing with this because um, it is not consistent. It is not clean. It is not. Um, I cannot. I, I, I cannot work with this and put machine learning algorithms on 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 this because it's just a bunch of bits and bytes, you know. So we had to understand that, and that's why this messy situation is so important. We had to understand that first. We have to clean this analog situation so that it creates 
digital clean information that then big data analysts can take and work with and make predictions and build algorithms on top of this. That, that, um, that's also something um, <clears throat> I experienced um, heavily that when you start working with data, you have, of course, you have a lot of assumptions. But if the preparation for this is not made properly, then you should not um, um, expect uh, the fantastic outcomes. It's, it, it probably will not come. Mm -hmm. um, when you are building a smart factory, you are installing, installing a lot of new devices, uh, yes. new technologies. And how is it with people, with employees, with learning them uh, to properly uh, use it, you know, because you, you, you had 4,000 people in Izmir and m most of them, uh, or, or maybe all of them, uh, had to learn these devices. Was it hard? What, uh, did it took, uh, did, did it take a lot of time? How was it with, with, with this, with learning the devices? Yes. So, um, so the first principle um, is, and for me will always um, continue to be so, um, is that devices are made for the people, not the people. Have, so the devices have to adapt to the people, not the people have to adapt to this device. In other words, if, if I make installations of software on the shop floor, I have to know who, whom I talk to. These are not IT experts and computer engineers that I'm writing a software for, but these are people who are some experts in their field. And no one gets a handbook when installing uh, a Facebook app on, um, or a WhatsApp app on, on the iPhone. You go to the app store, you make the installation and you start working. And if it is not self-explaining, then maybe you watch, I don't know, a one minute or two minute video on YouTube and off you go which means whatever software we were thinking about and whatever technology we were thinking about to put into place, and if it is in the office or if it is in the, on the shop floor, doesn't matter, had to meet these basic principles of no training. No, no, no training. Everything should be self-explaining. If you build an undon board, you should understand this and not have to study this. If you build an, uh, if you have a tablet on your site and there's a software made for this, it should be self-explaining. If I'm looking for my efficiency on this tablet, I should not dive into this and click a thousand times until I find it. I should see it in the moment when I need it. I should also, technical devices should not distract me from my job, which means like if I'm an operator sitting on a sewing machine and assembling jackets, I should not spend one minute on an undon board to understand something. I should maybe spend one second on this undon board so then I can come back and concentrate on my work because I'm not paid for IT, I'm paid for my outcome of this, of this job. So, um, so that is, uh, that's something that is, uh, from my point of view, super crucial if you think about um, making an industry 4.0 introduction into your organization, you should always think and look for technology and software that is mainly self-explaining. And that has to do with graphics, with user interfaces, with graphic, um, graphic design, the user experience. People talk a lot in cars nowadays from user experience. And I'm driving a Tesla. I know something about it because it is really entertaining to, to, to do so, to work with these functions. And, um, and some functions are not self-explaining and they get immediate response from the consumer saying, okay, why did you put this function on that sub menu? Because it's not self-explaining that I will not, that why would I find it there? And the same applies to, to, um, to technology on, um, in, in, in factories. It should, everything should be self-explaining and everything should be easy, as easy as possible to do so. And I guess there is some way to walk because some software companies still um, surprisingly don't, <laughs> don't talk to the users. Uh, we did this whenever we, whenever we made software, we would have regular operators testing it and it would not go to the shop floor 
and it would not be deployed um, if it if it was not self-explaining and easy. The easiness was was absolutely crucial here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we. Um, you know, nowadays, uh, and the, there's another topic which is called gamification, and I, I love this because everyone likes to, to play nowadays, everyone. When I was sitting in a plane, everyone around me was having making games, you know, no matter what age, not just the young ones, also the, the elder ones, everyone was playing on the... on the. So I thought, okay, if, if people like so much games and playing, then why not learn, um, learn something while playing? Um, and I was at um, I was at a conference in San Francisco Singularity University in 2000 I think it was in 18 18 or 17 and, and now it was in 18 and there was a company which which was called um, Classcraft and these were two brothers who who uh, they went to school and then they grew up they hated school always and then they grew up one became a mar marketing uh, guy the other one was it became a teacher and when their kids went to school, <laughs> surprisingly they saw that the kids hate school again you know like they did 25 years or 30 years before and also what they found out was that basically the school classes looked the same everything was the same the the, the classroom was the same the setting the the dynamics of the of the lectures everything was the same and they said but that's crazy you know these kids play i mean they are they are excited the whole weekend by playing video games and then they are exhausted after the first hour in school on monday morning why because that doesn't fit anymore if you are a six year old a seven year old boy and you're playing fortnite on the weekend in this speed lightning speed that this game is about and then on monday morning you sit in front of the teacher and start falling asleep because of this missing speed, because of the missing excitement and because of the missing interaction. You're just sitting there and getting flooded with information. That is not working anymore. So these guys built um, a, a software which was made for teachers and for, 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 uh, for school kids, which is called Classcraft. And so, so they, they, they said, okay, let's put this context of learning into a quest. Let's make it an adventure. If it is math or if it is history or if it is even learning, I don't know, um, something for, for sports, like cheer, uh, um, dan dancing and, and for the cheerleaders and something. So they put this into this system, which was called Classcraft. And they made scientific um, um, uh, surveys about how this improves the learning speed of kids. And it was astounding how much faster kids learned in this kind of format and how much more transparent teachers could determine the levels of their kids. Because everything is, is a one-on-one, -on -one, basically a blended learning concept and a one-on-one -on -one connection to, um, to the kids, between the teachers and the kids via a tablet. The teacher has the tablet and the kid has the tablet and they do something. And it's an inverted classroom training, which means like the kids learn at home and they come with the learned stuff into school and then they just talk with the teacher about the results. Not the other way around, like they sit in school, get flooded with information, go home and have to digest. It's completely vice versa. So when I thought, when I saw this and when I thought about this, how cool is that? And how, if this is scientifically proven that this is faster, then how cool would it be if we would train our employees in a blended learning gaming concept and even cooler thinking that we can record we can video record the best people we have so that every new trainer every new person who gets trained will learn from the best person i have in this operation and not like okay mr miller today is not here or he's ill so sorry you have to make the mr schmidt no, you will always learn from the best because you recorded the best. And secondly, you can work in your speed because the speed is determined by your own, um, by your own learning progress. You can re uh, rewind, you can fast forward, you can, you can learn in your speed. And to make the story short, we cut the learning experience and the training time in half, 50%. Now, everyone who knows something about training cost and everyone knows something about training um, employees in new skills knows that this is actually painful. It's, it's 
not value adding. It's just co pure cost. You need trainers, you need uh, the, the, the whole setup, you need everything, and then you have a, the person not working, but just training. So if you cut this in, in into 50%, then this is actually money, you know. And that is another story, like how can you attach, and that's something that I learned also over the last years, that whenever I saw something that resonates with my journey, I would put, put this and transfer it into my business. And that is why I'm in the, at the beginning of our talk, I, I said, you should not dare to copy something. You should not, you should not um, think about copying a story of someone else. You should always learn the basics of this, what you, what you have seen, and then try to make something useful in your organization. And, um, mm -hmm. and then turn out to something completely different. And uh, what about innovations coming from uh, regular employees? You know, uh, did you did you use some of uh, solutions that, uh, that, uh, that 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 came from from em employees? That you you know, uh, one employee said that it would be better to do something uh, different and you, you you thought yeah yeah we can do, do this and you did it uh, was it uh, was it uh, so in 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 case of izmir mm -hmm. so um innovation is something it's an interesting um innovation is some it's an interesting um <laughs> again a mindset and it's a, a word i was in 2017 at tesla and um and at tesla i was thinking but i went to tesla because on a, on a master class from the leadership network and they said okay how to how can you become an innovative company and i thought okay innovation at that time i thought okay innovation is something that you know i mean you have an innovation team you have innovation managers you have a head of innovation that was my thought. Okay, there, there are some guys somewhere in an ivory tower thinking about innovative stuff. And when it is innovative enough, then some others will come and make it and, and, and turn it into a profitable product or something like that. And when I, so when I went to Tesla in Fremont, um, I was not expecting to see the nicest factory in terms of car manufacturing because I've been to Porsche before and to Mercedes-Benz and, and, and BMW and I knew how a great um, German manufacturer, for example, looks like. And, and of course, what I saw at Tesla was not the first thing that I saw at Tesla were 1,500 software engineers and they were just explaining me everything around software and the user experience and something like that. And that's, by the way, why Tesla is so strong from my point of view, because they this, this is a computer on four wheels and makes a lot of fun uh, actually to drive and not vice versa. It's not a car that that you put some screens into. Um, and my feeling was that whomever I talked there, like the general met the plant manager, there was a, a guy coming from Audi who has moved then, uh, he moved to Tesla at that time. And even there was a guy who was making the tour with us. He was six months in the in the factory, in the company, and in, in the factory, and he was so super proud and talking about Tesla like he has been there. He was born there, you know. And um, and I understood that innovation um, is something that is said to be creating useful novelty, is creating something that people that that is somehow new, but also that is useful. Is not just creating crazy stuff is creating something that is useful and i thought that if 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 this organization manages to attract so many innovative brains who get at the same time also the chance to to and the space to be innovative and have creative and innovative ideas and put them into place i mean making them literally tangible then this is something appealing for for the Ismir factory as well. So I came back and I thought, okay, how can I how can I bring this back and how can I how can I implement what I've seen in, at Tesla in in a, in an apparel factory? And um and and we needed two things here. One thing was we needed a space, a room, or an environment for innovation. So we built we we changed the 
training center into an inno in inex center, an innovation excellence center. That was one thing. And the second thing was that, uh, that we said, okay, we have to make innovation a process. We have to make it an excellence. We have to make it something that is not a surprise moment that is happening with three super smart engineers somewhere in an office, but we have to make this, um, uh, we have to make this something that is uh, a daily habit. So, um, so we literally built something which was, uh, which was like a platform, thinking about innovation as a platform and, and fostering people and making people, pushing people towards innovation. And we even asked them about, we, this was fancy, this came from the, I think it came from the team leaders um, uh, team group they said okay let's find ambassadors for innovation so they made a they made a, 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 a um, uh, an action an activity and said okay listen who wants to be an innovation ambassador and like a group speaker or like a team speaker for innovation because we are going to develop them in innovation skills they will learn about tools like design thinking and others and um, and so when people have crazy ideas they then come they can come to you and you can tell them, oh, you know what? This is a great idea. Just you need two or three additional questions to answer. So maybe you come back in two weeks and then we continue further. So we built this innovation thinking into an excellence process so that innovation is not mm -hmm. something that happens sometimes, but happens basically every day. And again, I'm probably you get it. I'm always talking about philosophy here and I'm talking about the mindset. But this is so, so important that when you think about technology, technology is not made for the, the engineers, is made for the people who have a better life in their jobs. And if you are an, an, an employee on the shop floor who has great ideas, I have to make everything possible to listen to you. But mm -hmm. I, as a general manager, I cannot listen to 4,000 brains, 4,000 ideas. But what I can do is I can set up with the management a team that clusters ideas, bring the right people together, shrink them, manage them together, and build out of 1,000 ideas three who are actually improving the profitability of a factory or the speed or the efficiency or the quality. And, and so, so that turning something that is crazy in terms of ideas sometimes, turning it into something which is tangible and which, uh, which is beneficial for the organization. That is what we built in this innovation excellence approach. Yes, um, our time is, is passing so, so fast, but yes. uh, we have some questions from our viewers. Yes. So maybe we can we can go to Q and A, uh, yes. and uh, the first question is uh, I think it's about Izmir. Was top management of this plant prepared for your criticism? No. And uh, hmm? <laughs> no, no, they were not. Uh, of course, they were not prepared. Uh, first up, they were my former colleagues. So it was, of course, it was not uh, it was not an easy peasy thing coming from the headquarter and then saying, "Listen, guys, thank you very much for, for what you have done, but now we move on to something else." Of course, this was not easy, and it, it um, and it took quite um, a while to to build this kind of confidence of something differently to move on and to 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 find a different target. But um, who knows me? Um, uh, personally knows that I can be quite rigid when I have an idea and I think that this is a concept that the idea is right so um, so you need as a as of course as a managing director um, you need a kind of confidence for what you do clearly you have to listen to people and I listen a lot to people uh, but you need also to to have a convincing story that people want to commit to and want to follow you uh, there's a saying at Goratex, which is uh, saying, if you want to be a leader, find followers. So if you, so this is not something that you can dictate. You cannot dictate smart factory. That's not, never going to fly. But what you can do is you can prepare your top management and your middle management and your, and your operators for this by explaining the philosophy behind and explaining the say, better life or work conditions 
once it is established. And that is what I try to, to do with my top management, um, to, to put them on this journey and say, listen, I have this idea and I, I think I saw this at, at Siemens, I saw this at other areas and I, I guess this is the right direction. But I cannot do this by myself. I'm not the super guy here. I'm just your managing director and I'm fully dependent on you. So let's do this together. And uh, that's the direction, come up with ideas. And I actively invited them to create ideas around this story. That was the first, uh, in July 2015, that was the first top management meeting we did there, was basically mm -hmm. around creating ideas. So no, it is not something that you can dictate and not the, the, the top management was not um, convinced from the first moment. But um, um, I, I think today, most, probably most of them would say it was the right direction. But um, ha, 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 did, did you have to change some of the persons of this top management? Uh, I, I mean, uh, did you have to find some new leaders or, or you kept working with, with all the world? Yes. Um, there was very little of very very little uh, did we change in the in the in, in the people um, the, the the positions the, um, we flattened the hierarchy we had seven levels of hierarchy and we made it four so there were some positions were cancelled but that was not because I, I I didn't like the people and they had and they kept a job in the factory but because with digitalization comes easiness and comes transparency and you there's a lot of management which you don't need. A lot of meetings, a lot of management levels, a lot of um, uh, interaction happens very flat. So we deleted hierarchy levels, and these and there were people leaving the factory. But we did this very noiseless and very smooth. So um, so no, and I I'm I'm also I'm not the big fan of jumping somewhere and firing 50% of the um, of the workforce, or let's say firing 50% of the management, making the rest totally scared bringing new people in and then saying, okay, let's, let's jump on this convincing story. <laughs> I'm not a fan of this. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of this kind of management. So for me, it was more important to make them understand that it's for their better condition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another question as parting words, if you could mention three hardest things in implementing industry 4.0, what what would it be the hardest three hardest things in implementation i guess the three hardest thing the first hardest thing is that you actually have to create your own convincing industry 4.0 story and that is also what i get as feedback um, in my in my current role as a consultant that people come to me and say listen my ceo says go digital so i have the backing of my ceo and i i have some I have called some IT companies and they said, oh yeah, we can do this and we can do that. But actually I have no idea how this makes sense. So the first thing that I would always start with is making sense, making a convincing story that you do for your particular journey, because this is not, I cannot repeat it enough, it's not a copycat story. It's something that you build for yourself. The second thing then is, um, to find followers. You have to have an organization which understands your journey. And this is, of course, it starts with, uh, with, with top managers. You want to make sure that, these, these can, that, that they can follow this convincing story. But you, have to, you need followers, you need ambassadors who, who, um, who can uh, multiply and deploy this idea. And then the third thing is that you have to, it sounds maybe a bit strange, but you have to make HR and IT become very close friends. Because, um, because Industry 4.0 is about, um, is very much about technology, but it's also very much about changing the habits of people. And that has to go hand in hand. It has to go very close to each other. It's, um, it's yes, you can have lots of, calculations of ROIs, and you will find also lots of um, uh, reasonable calculations about this. But if you cannot take the people with you, then it will be just installations of technology, and that's not uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, so these would be the three things. 
Yeah, and thank you. And uh, and another question from from our viewers: uh, Are there the businesses? Uh, are there um, the parts of industry where uh, introducing uh, industry point for all is impossible? Do you think uh, are are there any areas or or every area needs industry point for all? So the thing is, the question is, what is Industry 4.0? And most of the people think that Industry 4.0 is, um, is about technology. But it's actually, technology is just the tool in order to fulfill a particular demand of a market. Um, it's like if you look into the first, um, uh, first second and third uh, industrial revolution, then always a technology appeared and then it changed the way how things happened. The first... In the first um, uh, industrial revolution, a technology appeared to produce more pieces in an industrial way. That created much more demand on the market side, and that created, so people were able to buy more stuff because there was more available, and that created more demand, which improved then the efficiency of the factories, which created more, and that, so that turned into an industrial um, uh, circle. So if you think about Industry 4.0, um, then... There is no way that the that the digitalization, uh, which is the mega trend for me, is not Industry 4.0. The digitalization, actually, the twin of this global, whatever. I mean, how can you say this? Of this, this global physical ecosystem gets a digital global ecosystem, and that is going to uh, go faster and further, um, no matter what. If I'm a tailor, if I'm a carpenter, or if I'm I'm doing pharmacy, it doesn't matter. This, this is a mega trend that, that happens right now. So that means that I have to find a way in this economy and in this system to, um, uh, I have to, to find a way to accept that the consumer has a much more proximity to me than ever before. I can be in touch with everyone on this planet via Twitter or email or whatsoever and, 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 and Instagram. So also the, the, the customer can demand something special only made for him and that again doesn't matter if it is a house or if it is a pair of shoes so which means like if my organization is ready for this then it's great if it is not then i need this technology to make my organization survivable because if i can only produce a hundred shoes in one color and i have a hundred customers who want hundred colors then i'm out of business you know, that means that with the rising demand of, um, of complexity of individual consumer demand, I have to make my organization future fit. And no matter if I'm, yeah, maybe vaccines is different right now, but no matter if what industry mm -hmm. I am, I have to accept that the technology helps me to stay in business. So for me, there's no industry out of this. Really not. Yeah, I see. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, we, we, I feel we could uh, we could talk for hours, but we should uh, we should uh, go to an end. So thank you very much for your time and uh, for this this uh, very very interesting thing things that you uh, that you said. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you for, for, for everything. Thank you very much. And um, again, to the audience, find your way for Industry 4.0. Yeah, and uh, talking to the audience, uh, you can you you can uh, find the recording uh, of this uh, of the, of our interview on uh, wnp.pl uh, web uh, portal. So so visit us, and later this re this recording will be available uh, in w uh, at wnp.pl web portal. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care.